Thank you, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for the privilege of speaking today. Um, I will speak frankly, so I hope you will bear it. Uh, but I think we are amongst friends, and in order to make the discussion useful, we might as well be open and frank. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that relations between Asia and Latin America are very friendly, but to be perfectly honest with you, have not fulfilled a full potential. Our regions are divided by great distances. It took me, I think, maybe 30 hours to reach here. Divided by different historical backgrounds and also divided by language. I think the fact that they speak in Spanish and English is also another colonial kind of course. <laughs> but these gaps must change. And the reason they have to change is that in both Asia and in Latin America, we have to restructure our economies. And we have to restructure our economies in order to meet challenges of both globalization and the digital revolution. Our people, whether it's in Argentina or in Singapore, are all demanding good jobs with good wages. I uh, understand there's a strike right now. Yep. And in a sense, that is also a reflection of this demand for good jobs and good wages, and our people are impatient for that. But even as we in try to achieve this, it is also the responsibility of governments all over the world to make sure that overall our economies remain competitive and to do so while the world is changing so dramatically and so rapidly. And so there are a couple of things which governments have to do and to do so urgently. First, we have to invest in our people, that means education, training. Second, we have to invest in infrastructure make sure that all of us have first world infrastructure in order to allow our people to maximize what they have learned and the training and the skills and to also unleash the innovative potential of our companies. And there's a third dimension which is to forge new partnerships. And that's really the context for my discussion today. How do we build effective partnerships and linkages across this great distance Latin America and Asia. In a sense, the digital revolution has eliminated geography as a barrier. Because after all, to be able to send an email, it is transmitted at the speed of light. And therefore, we have to try to exploit this potential in order to build closer economic links, to expand mindshare, and to maximize opportunities for companies and in our respective areas. Let me deal first with the challenges and the opportunities in the changing world. We all know, or at least politicians should know, that there is a rising global tide of protectionism and narrow nationalism, and very often couched in populist terms. This represents a negative reaction against global trade against economic integration, in fact, against the very whole process of globalization itself. We've seen the frustrations expressed by people who feel that they have not benefited fairly or not benefited quickly enough from the, from the processes of globalization and trade liberalization. We have seen a withdrawal from multilateral trade deals and calls to move production back home. All this represents the fact that the previous global consensus on the benefits of free trade, on economic integration, on building bridges across regions, this global consensus is now under deep stress. Our countries also face many transnational challenges. For instance, climate change, terrorism, religious extremism, 
epidemics. And these global challenges are reminders that actually we can't solve this by isolating ourselves, by retreating behind protectionist walls. So we need to recognize that the global economic environment of today is shaped not by developments in any single region, but will be shaped by the major economies in Asia, Europe, and the Americas. If we think about it, the US and China are currently the two largest economies in the world. And in fact, they are the major trading partners for many of us in Asia and in Latin America. In the case of Singapore, China is the largest trading partner. In fact, Singapore is the largest foreign investor in China. I believe in Argentina, China is probably your second largest, second or third largest trading partner. Now, it's important to bear in mind that small states like Singapore, just five and a half million, or even medium states like Argentina with 43 million. The brutal truth is in the global economy, small and medium-sized states are really price takers. They're not price makers, we are price takers. And therefore, what policies and the nature of the relationship between the US and China matters a lot to us. If they have a positive and cooperative relationship, it will be better for us. But on the other hand, if there's uncertainty, and worse, if there's a trade war, it will make life very difficult for us. But the point is, we have no say. I, I, was, I think President Xi Jinping has just landed in Florida, meeting President Trump shortly. I am sure uh, people all over the world hope that meeting goes well and they achieve an effective bonus preventive and, and give stability, confidence and opportunities to the rest of us. But just remember, we have no say. We just have to cope and deal with whatever they decide, whatever actions and consequences arise. Now, having said that we have no say when we are dealing with, with engaging with superpowers, we actually do have a say on our own domestic policies, and we do have a say in the way we relate to one another. And the point I wanted to make today is that we need to look beyond our traditional frameworks, and we need to find like-minded partners to forge these new paths. And that's really context for my presence today and for my visit to Argentina because we are like-minded but to engage with each other in a significant way actually requires us to break beyond our traditional frameworks where we actually do quite well but in our respective spheres not sufficiently engaged across the barriers of geography, history and language. Actually these are not really new ideas. If you think about it, FELAC, the Forum for East Asia Latin America Cooperation, was established in 1999, a long time ago. And its objective was to stimulate interaction and to promote greater interaction linkage between Asia and Latin America. These objectives are still relevant, but the context has changed significantly. And I want to submit to you that it is important for us to maximize what we can in order to step up relations. And we have to do so, especially now, when there is a growing anti-trade sentiment in many parts of the world. So it's more urgent that we proceed on this agenda now. We have to make the case that free trade expands opportunities for everyone. and we also need to recognize politically that just having growth, even if it's high growth rate, is not enough because the fact is that free trade can often have differential impacts on the different segments of our society. And therefore, the political challenge for all of us is that even as we pursue free trade, we need to make the necessary domestic arrangements to make sure that no one gets left behind. 
So it is a stark reminder that foreign policy or trade policy actually begins at home. Now I want to touch on, on bilateral relations between Argentina and Singapore. Actually, we established diplomatic relations 40 years ago, 1974. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you have been to Singapore over the years, but if you went back uh, far enough, uh, it was quite different from what it is today. Uh, well, one part that hasn't changed is that we're still a very small country. Uh, we have, of course, tried to reclaim land, but even then, it's still only about 700 square kilometers. Uh, I'm not sure how many thousand times <laughs> smaller than Argentina we are. Uh, we have 5.8 million people. We have no natural resources, no oil, no gas, no gold, nothing. Uh, we gained our independence in 1965. Um, actually, to be honest with you, we didn't even fight for independence. We were divorced. We were picked up and were forced to be independent and find our way. At that point in time, in 1965, our unemployment rate was 14%. Our per capita GDP was about $500 US. Uh, there was therefore no guarantee that we would survive. Today, we have survived and thrived. Um, our per capita GDP has gone up by about 100 times in 51 years. <coughs> Our success, we believe, reflects the great investment in human capital, in education, in political and social stability, in building an attractive environment for businesses, plugged into the global network, uh, a government that has been obsessed with integrity, with competence, and the fact that if your people have to work very hard, your leaders also have to demonstrate in a transparent way that they are honest, they're doing their best, it doesn't mean we get everything right, but a track record builds up over the years. So a small trading nation, a small entrepreneur in the heart of Southeast Asia has now become a regional shipping, transport, logistics, financial, and legal hub over 51 years. Uh, the other odd thing about Singapore is that if you look at our trade figures, our trade is three and a half times our GDP. So when we, that, what that means is that when we talk about free trade, to us it's not just negotiations. Uh, it's not a debating point, it is lifeblood. Without free trade, we would be in deep, deep trouble. So because of that, uh, we have been strong proponents of the WTO process. But as far as I'm sure you all know, uh, that has been a very laborious and very difficult process. And we could not wait for the WTO to settle the multilateral process on a global scale. We have had to pursue an extensive network of free trade agreements. Now, if you think about Argentina, on the other hand, you know, much, much larger than Singapore. I believe you have the third largest economy in Latin America. Uh, I don't need to tell you that you have an abundance of land. I think you told me just now, in terms of land area, you, it's the whole of Western Europe, excluding yes. Russia. Uh, and in all that land, you only have 43 million people. And uh, you have been richly blessed with natural resources, including recently adding on discoveries of shale gas. You, uh, I believe you now have the world's second largest reserves of shale gas, fourth largest reserves of shale oil. So you are a very blessed country. Relations between Argentina and Singapore have been friendly, but to be honest with you, as I said earlier, uh, despite this friendliness, despite this similarity in outlook, the, we have not yet done enough together. We have not yet exploited all the opportunities that our friendly relations and strategic alignment should have allowed us to. But I'm here now because I believe the timing and the circumstances are right, and I believe the political will is in place, 
and the economic interests of the businesses are aligned, and we have signaled our intention to step up our engagement in a big way. Argentina is currently Singapore's seventh largest trading partner in Latin America. Bilateral trade is about US 240 million, which frankly is a very small number. It should be many, many multiples of that. Argentina's economic and structural reforms, I believe, have created potential to boost bilateral trade and investment flows significantly. And just now when I met President Macri, I said, given time, the policies that he has instituted will have a major impact on attracting investments, trade, and, and economic moves. But it sometimes needs time, and he was expressing his impatience that these the fruits of these policies need to be harvested early in order to maintain the political momentum for these changes that he's trying to, to implement. Now, some of the Singapore companies actually are already in Argentina. For instance, PSA, the Port of Singapore Authority International, already operates the Exogun container terminal in Buenos Aires. I believe this is one of the larger and more efficient terminals. Olam Argentina runs an integrated peanut supply chain and then has expanded into soy, corn, beans, and rice. This is, as I said earlier, my first visit as Foreign Minister to Latin America and we have also appointed a new Singapore Honorary Consul General uh, to Buenos Aires. We are also looking forward to Foreign Minister Malcora visiting Singapore, I think in July this year, where she will open, actually I should say reopen, an Argentinian embassy in Singapore because there used to be an embassy right from the early years until about 2001 she closed, well, it's going to reopen. We will have an Argentinian ambassador in Singapore again. And I believe this will make a difference to engaging our businesses, our know, Singaporeans, and expand opportunities on both sides. There are possibilities to do more, not just in trade and investment, but also for us to work together on third-country third technical cooperation on food security and safety, on student exchanges and on interesting and innovative projects for the digital economy. We believe that these steps will take our relationship to a much higher level. I am very encouraged that Argentinian companies such as Tenaris and Grupo Bago have already leveraged on Singapore and are using us as a gateway to Asia. Because Singapore is so small, all the foreign companies who come to Singapore are not actually only targeting the Singapore market, but they're really targeting a much larger Asian and Southeast Asian market. And we believe this makes a compelling case because of our strategic location. And actually, if you look at the flight routes, half the world's population lives within a seven-hour flight radius of Singapore. And Singapore is a capital exporting country. As I said earlier, we are the largest foreign investor in China. We're also one of the largest foreign investors in India and in several ASEAN countries. So, basing your companies in Singapore, networking with us, I believe, will help you navigate the business and investment opportunities throughout Asia. We offer a business-friendly and favourable investment climate with a strong rule of law, sanctity of contracts, intellectual property protection, an educated and highly skilled workforce. Uh, our union membership, by the way, is growing, uh, but the strikes are very infrequent. Uh, in fact, our special, what we call tripartite relationship between the unions, the employers, and the government is one of our secret recipes to competitiveness. So, worth coming to study. <laughs> we are also plugged into regional markets, uh, operating environments, and business networks, and many, many, thousands of multinational corporations from America <coughs> and Europe in fact, have their regional headquarters in Singapore and use Singapore as a base to access the Asian market and Asian investors and consumers. 
So I'm really here to do a sales pitch to encourage Argentinian companies to use Singapore as a springboard into Asia. And uh, I'm also here to tell you all that we'll be happy to partner Argentina and to share our experiences and to seek new opportunities for your companies. We also see abundant opportunities in Latin America and Asia, not just as alternative markets for exports and services, but also to learn from each other, to leverage on each other's networks, our strengths, our expertise for mutual benefit. Uh, that's also a reason why Singapore has become an observer to the Pacific Alliance, and why tomorrow I'll be meeting the foreign ministers of Mercosur. Given these current uncertainties, uh, I'm trying to make the case that there should be a free trade agreement between Singapore and Mercosur to convince them tomorrow. And I believe that if we can succeed in making a progressive step on this, we will send a positive signal to the world that we, we remain open for business, we still believe in free trade, and economic integration will bring great opportunities to our people and our businesses. And the point here, and I say this because my ASEAN colleague is here as well from Indonesia, that when we ask Mercosur to consider the free trade agreement with Singapore, this is only step one. Because the real big objective is ultimately, hopefully, to get a Mercosur ASEAN free trade agreement. So, but any steps with us are pathfinder, an initial step to open up the path to a much longer and broader journey. So, let me talk a little bit about ASEAN. Southeast Asia and the 10 of us who are members of ASEAN are really a key part of the Asian success story. ASEAN has immense untapped potential and remains a bright spot. We sit strategically between China and India and across several strategic shipping lanes. We are rich in natural resources. Actually, everyone is rich in natural resources in ASEAN except Singapore. Singapore. <laughs> ASEAN as a whole has a large and young population of 628 million. That's actually a European size population. A population that is skilled, that's optimistic, that has a rising middle class, rising incomes, and is hungry for food, for energy, for new goods and services. ASEAN remains a bright spot, despite the relatively anemic growth at a global scale. Because, for instance, the average growth in ASEAN is about 6% compared to a global average of only 4%. And the other fact is, the population in ASEAN remains young, and we have not yet harvested the fruits of the demographic dividend. We have formed an ASEAN economic community. This was established in 2015 to create a single market, and a single production zone, and a single investment destination. And today we present with the combined GDP of 2.5 US trillion dollars, but this will quadruple to 10 trillion dollars by 2050, or earlier. And if we succeed in doing that, we will become the world's fourth largest single market, that's after the US, EU, and China, and we will be a compelling trade and investment and that's why we want to persuade Argentina and Latin America to look things to look east into Southeast Asia. ASEAN also has a wide network of free trade agreements. And in fact, one major free trade agreement we're negotiating right now is called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. This basically will be a multilateral free trade agreement that includes all the 10 countries of ASEAN plus our dialogue partners including especially the two massive economies of China and India. This will be a free trade area with a combined GDP of 17 trillion US dollars, or one third of global GDP. So again, there's huge potential for Argentinian companies. I'm very glad that Argentina has applied to accede to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia. And needless to say, Singapore will fully support Argentina's application and we believe this is an important step for Argentina to engage ASEAN. 
Argentina is currently the pro tempore president of Mercosur, and I believe with this current leadership, with this current set of policies, uh, let me again speak very frankly, we sense a major change in the orientation and the outlook of Mercosur. So, and on our side of the world, Singapore will be the chairman of ASEAN in 2018. So that's all the more reason that whatever we do between Argentina and Singapore will, I believe, have potential implications on what we can do between Mercosur and ASEAN. And we need to find new ways and more effective cross-regional cooperation, which I believe will deliver rich dividends in the years to come. Singapore and Argentina have also cooperated very well in multilateral fora at the UN. We've supported each other where our interests are aligned, and we will continue to find platforms where we can do more together. In today's world, we need diverse players to come together to facilitate solutions in a constructive way. Um, I'm glad that Argentina will hold the G20 presidency in 2018. Singapore has made useful contributions and played an active role in past G20 meetings as a convener of the Global Governance Group. The Global Governance Group has helped to channel the views of a broad range of countries to the G20, making the G20 process more inclusive. And we've served as a bridge between the G20 and the wider UN membership. So we look forward to continuing to work with the G20 through Argentina and particularly focus on topics including infrastructure, sustainable development, and this morning we were discussing this need to prepare people for the digital economy, the new jobs, the new skills, the new education, the new uh, training that needs to go with it. So there's a lot to be done and we look forward again to working and collaborating in this area. So let me just conclude by again emphasizing that there are many, many opportunities. And these opportunities should have been tapped a long time ago. But it is better to be late than never. And given the circumstances in the world today, with all the challenges, with all the changes, and even with the pushback against free trade and economic integration, but there are bright spots and Argentina and Singapore, Mercosur and Latin America and Asia and Southeast Asia, by building bridges instead of walls, we can work together, we can encourage and turbocharge greater flows of trade, goods, people and services, and ultimately provide and improve the welfare of our people in our respective regions. So thank you very much. We'll be happy to see you.